and welcome to Good Game. I'm Bajo. And I'm Hex. Hex, what are you in the mood for this week? Uh, I think I'd like some future explodey action and then maybe some old-fashioned seafaring and some dragons. Oh, well, I think this week's games can cover all of that. Yes. Starting with Call of Duty Advanced Warfare. The targets are 12 o'clock. Plus, the Assassin's Creed franchise heads back to the open seas in Rogue. You there! Stay! Where are you? And we venture forth to unite the land in Dragon Age Inquisition. Every great war has its heroes. I'm just curious what kind you'll be. But before any of that, can you name the game for this week? the Assassin's A-Team focusing their efforts into Unity on current-gen platforms, Assassin's Creed Rogue is one last hurrah of sailing, stabbing and free-running on the Xbox 360 and PS3. Hex, let us take to the seas once more. Aye aye, Captain. Stay my blade from the flesh of the innocent. Hide in plain sight. Never compromise the Assassin Brotherhood. These are the tenets of the creed, the principles I used to live by. I was a young man then. I could not have imagined what the future had in store for me, nor the cost I would choose to bear. My name is Shay Patrick Cormac. In Assassin's Creed Rogue, you take the role of the charming young Irishman Shay Cormac. As a youthful recruit to the Assassin Brotherhood, Shay has a yearning for respect and a knack for getting into mischief. Admit it, I nearly had you. Yes, but he's not quite the arrogant swashbuckler that Edward Kenway was. Shay is a righteous man who strives to do the right thing, not caring which banner he's sailing under so long as he's allowed to pursue his altruistic goals. Rogue takes place between 1752 and 1761, spanning the Seven Years' War. As usual, the Assassins and Templars are at each other's throats, fighting for control of some ancient artefacts. When Shay is sent by the Assassins to find one of these relics, he discovers their true destructive nature. God had nothing to do with this. After confronting the Brotherhood and imploring them to change their ways, they turn him down. I mean, let's face it, they can be jerks sometimes. I will not let you destroy everything we have built! <laughs> Shay inevitably betrays the Creed, severing all ties, and quickly finds himself fighting alongside the Templar cause, setting out to stop the assassins in their misguided pursuit. Do not let those outlaws have another victim. Good. I really liked Shay as a character, and not just because of his heart-melting accent and boyish charm. You genuinely empathise with him as he struggles with the internal conflict of killing his former comrades to defend what he believes to be right. Hope. I pray it's not you. There are a bunch of cool new characters, familiar faces, Adewale. and historical legends brought to life. Captain Shay Cormac, Captain James Cook. Pleased to make your acquaintance. Pleasure's mine, sir. Oh, he discovered our country, kind of. <laughs> yes, however, not all the characters are so well constructed. Uh, might I suggest we improve our vessel? The Morrigan is good, but with a few more supplies, she could be unstoppable. And you know, there's a French outpost nearby I happen to know. That guy sounds like he belongs in a deodorant commercial, not sailing the North Atlantic. <laughs> yeah, it's an odd fit for the voice actor, isn't it? Speaking of the ocean, how nice was it to be back amongst the waves? The world is a pretty similar size to Black Flag. However, instead of one large map to explore, there are three smaller and more diverse locations. Each has been crafted with a nice amount of detail and they certainly feel unique. There are the lush woods of the Canadian Riverlands and the well-worn streets of New York but the hero environment is definitely the North Atlantic, with its icebergs, narwhals, Careful with that horn. and water cold enough to kill you. They're all gorgeous locations, to be sure. To be sure, to be sure. Although I didn't quite embrace them as I did with Black Flag's Caribbean Isles. With those, you could almost feel the blistering heat of the sun and smell the sweat and salt in the air. Although that might have been just because I was playing it in the summer in a poorly ventilated room. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean, though. There was just something so alluring about those crystal blue waters. That's a small price to pay for a lead in the precursor box. But Rogue still carries over those ship-faring mechanics that we know and love. Yeah, and the sea combat is as fun as ever. Your vessel, the Morrigan, is pretty well equipped from the get-go, so you don't have to spend as much time upgrading before taking to the enemy. 
Yeah, I think we can both agree though that the best returning feature of the sea shanties. Mm. Sing me hearties! And the worst returning feature is Abstergo HQ. You were just an anonymous. Animus, yes? Yes, once again you are forced to endure the tedium of Abstergo's glossy halls. This time round, someone has uploaded a virus into the company's Animus systems. A file labeled Shea Cormac was booby trapped with some kind of virus. Your job is to prevent things like this. While this may sound like a lame plot device, it is. It genuinely is. Get a virus scanner, they're free now. Yeah, I can't really argue with that. Although the virus does turn out to be a decent enough excuse for Shay to bounce through glitches in time. It only happens a few times, but it's used as a mechanic to tie Rogue to Unity. Got it. She's in Paris, all right. There are quite a few of those little crossover nods to Unity, which we are also playing at the moment. So much so that Rogue kind of feels like a big ad for Unity. Maybe a little bit, but Rogue still definitely stands strong on its own. <laughs> At about 8 to 10 hours, the campaign is a lot shorter than previous Assassin's games, but I actually think that works in its favour. There's much less faffing about with follow and eavesdropping quests. Yeah, they've really cut the fat, and it means the next exciting action sequence is always moments away. Not that I thought Black Flag overstayed its welcome, but it's just nice to have a, a streamlined Hollywood adventure this time. Yeah, I agree, but never fear completionists. There are collectibles and chores aplenty, which should take playtime to 20 plus hours. Fortune's favor. As expected, there's not a whole lot of new mechanics, but there are some interesting tweaks to the gameplay. Because you are working for the Templars, your assassin enemies are naturally far sneakier than we're used to, even going as far as using our own tricks against us. Cheeky assassins. Very cheeky. By using your eagle vision, you can reveal the location of these stealthy stabbers and get the jump on them. <laughs> before they do the same to you. Oh, feel my butt. It's a borrowed mechanic from the abandoned PvP mode of old, but it's a welcome addition to the single player combat. Yes, although I think you'll find the best addition to the combat is the grenade launcher. You can take on groups of enemies with sleep and berserk gases, or you can make a much less subtle approach. Very cool. What are you going to give it, Hex? I think Rogue is a commendable addition to the series and definitely worth checking out if you're still on older systems. Regardless, though, if you're a big Assassin's Creed fan, I also think it's worth dusting off your old console and jumping back on deck. I'm giving it eight and a half. Yeah, there is a lot to like here. I'm not sure if I could recommend it if you had moved on to next gen. And personally, while I appreciate the shorter length, I'm still a little fatigued by the old formula and I'm looking forward to chatting about Unity's attempts to revitalise the series next week. So I'm giving Rogue 7.5 out of 10. And now here is Goose with the news. Here's what's making headlines this week. Electronic Arts has ceased development on its free-to-play MOBA title Dawngate. Despite the game being playable via beta access for over a year, its servers will be shut down in February 2015. Group general manager of Dawngate Matt Bromberg said that although the game has grown, they were not seeing the progress they'd hoped for. People who spent money during the beta period will be offered refunds on their purchases. They won't know what it is. Microsoft has filed a trademark application for, wait for it, Battletoads. Originally released by Rare for the NES in 1991, Battletoads is considered to be one of the most challenging games ever made, often referred to as being unbeatable. The new trademark covers game software and online video games, which suggests but by no means confirms that Microsoft may revive the infamous Toad Brawler. Blizzard Entertainment and Legendary Pictures have released the full cast list for the 2016 film adaptation of Warcraft. Some notable inclusions are Travis Fimmel, best known for his role in the History Channel drama Vikings, and Clancy Brown, a veteran voice actor and the face of many memorable villains. It's better to burn out than to fade away. <laughs> And that's all for this week. Back to you in the studio. Thanks, Goose. After last year's disappointing Call of Duty Ghost Dogs, there was a bit of a feeling that maybe the series should go the way of Old Yeller. But can Advanced Warfare right the ship by setting it in the future and adding a bit of Kevin Space Dog? Let's find out. Do you now preside over the world's largest standing military? So what's next for Jonathan Irons?
about the campaign, which is set in the year 2054, with North Korea invading South Korea. Everybody know what's going on? Everybody know they're going? And they literally drop you into the role of Jack Mitchell, a United States Marine who is played by the quite dreamy Troy Baker. He is super dreamy. It's just finally starting to sink in. You then find yourself working for the private military company Atlas, run by the always charming Oscar-winning Kevin Spacey, aka Jonathan Irons. Sergeant. Then off you go around the world, meddling in the affairs of other countries, doing as Kevin Space Dog commands without any political baggage. An operation on foreign sovereign soil, it would be an act of war without congressional approval. Atlas is an internationally registered private company. We don't need Congress. What do you think of the story overall, Bajo? I am happy to say, Hex, I quite enjoyed this Call of Duty story. Normally they're all over the shop and I can't follow what's going on. And blah, But this, I was on board the whole way through. It's not a storytelling masterpiece, but for Call of Duty, it's pretty good. How's my boy doing? He's a work in progress. Well, keep working. This is a great soldier. Although there are some pretty weak dialogue points and a few ham-fisted attempts at stirring up emotion. Press X to pay respects. It's like in Shadow of Mordor. Press X to kiss your wife. <laughs> <laughs> Happy anniversary, my love. Happy end. This is beautiful. But this is easily one of the strongest campaigns in the franchise. Yeah, and there are some amazing performances, by Spacey in particular, captured in breathtaking detail. There's an old military saying, you treat your men like you would your own beloved sons and they'll follow you into the deepest valley. I lost my son. And it taught me the importance of seizing the moment. Plus, I like that you're only ever seeing through Mitchell's eyes, not bouncing around between different characters. It just makes it way more easier to follow. Yeah, I agree. But let's leave the story there and talk about the graphics. Oh, these are good graphics. Ha! Oh. I haven't been this impressed by Call of Duty visuals since the original Modern Warfare. And the cutscenes are just so well directed. There's plenty of coverage. You always know what's going on. It's legitimately stunning at times, and I love the fact that they've managed to move all the HUD onto your gun to let you fully soak it all in. So immersive, Hex, full immersion. Oh, she's a looker for sure. Uh, plus, the jump to the future has brought a welcome new assortment of toys to play with. Every soldier comes equipped with exosuits, robotic exoskeletons that come loaded with various abilities like booster jets or a slow-mo enabling overdrive. You get different ability presets for each mission though, so you can only ever really use the toys that they want you to use. Mm. My personal favourite was the grappling hook. There's a mission about halfway through where you get to just be Batman and grapple around the level, doing long range stealth kills from the bushes. I did find it a bit hard to keep track of which abilities I had though. The symbols on your gun are hard to interpret, and because your abilities change each mission, I never knew what button activated what. Too much immersion, Hex. Too much. Yeah, I actually ended up forgetting I had that most of the time. But I did love all those new grenades, with both a utility grenade and an explosive grenade to choose from. Each has three settings you can switch between. So, for example, your utility grenade can detect threats, send out an EMP, or be a flashbang. Especially like those threat grenades. We've seen that thing before where you can detect enemies in smoke, but they've just done it in a really cool way. I also am a big fan of jetpacks, especially sci-fi jetpacks. Just the way you're gliding down and you feel it you know, correcting and balancing, cool sci-fi stuff. <laughs> and the only thing better than cool grenades and cool jetpacks is when you combine the two. One thing I thought that felt a little tacked on was the upgrade system. At the end of each mission, if you've reached certain goals, you get points to spend on upgrading your soldier. So you can carry some extra grenades or more health, you know, that kind of thing. You know, I can see what they're trying to do by adding a bit of an RPG element to it, but they're such minor additions that it just felt a bit out of place to me. Yeah, I see your point, but I actually quite like them, having little goals to strive towards. I think they've improved the vehicle sections from previous efforts. We're only going to have one shot at getting the bastard. So I will need Flying a jet through that ravine and piloting that hover tank stood out as particularly awesome, and a big improvement over last year's Ferrari tank. I don't know, I think most of those vehicle sections still just have that kind of COD wonkiness to them. Well, the handling just feels a bit too twitchy and not quite right. And they're always in such tight rails and so scripted. There's just no room for improvisation. Even if you're just a bit too slow, instant fail. I agree, but that's kind of COD's thing, a linear head rush campaign, and it's hard not to love it when it works well. Yeah. 
Yeah, I just wish there was a little bit more opportunity to go off the beaten path and not get instantly killed with a fail menu every time I didn't do exactly what they wanted. And the few times they do open things up a bit, like that Batman-style mission, really stand out. Don't move. Tangles on your back. So I'd just like to see a little bit more of that approach. Yeah, I, I agree. There's some aggravating level design at times. I thought we were a bit beyond invisible walls. Put a wall there or just let me go there. Also, that cross the road section is ridiculous. There are literally two pedestrian crossings right next to you. But can you use them? No. You're forced to cross the road into a path of the world's biggest jerk drivers. Pedestrians clearly don't have the right of way in this country, but let's talk about the multiplayer. Yes, there's of course your usual plethora of returning game modes and a few new ones thrown into the mix, like the ball game esque Uplink. Uplink achieved. But it's the exosuits that really mix things up. Great assist. I mean, if you thought COD was fast paced before, just wait till you see it when everyone has jetpacks and can boost around everywhere. It's so nice to have something in there that actually makes it feel a bit different, too. It gives you that second chance to make a hasty retreat or confuse an attacker. It's also good to see that there are playlists which remove them if you want a pure experience. They've expanded on the Pick 10 system with Pick 13, which lets you mix and match everything in your loadout to your heart's content. But I think the best new feature is that gun range. You can instantly try out any gun from the menu and see how it handles, and if you like it. Gun ranges aren't new, but it loads so quickly. It's a genius feature. We played this on Xbox One and PC, and we didn't get any serious lag, but there have been reports of it out there. There are dedicated servers coming for PC, which is good, but they're not here just yet. All right, well, let's quickly talk about the Exo Survival Mode, which is basically their take on the ever-popular Horde Mode. You and up to three friends deck yourselves out in either a light, heavy, or specialist Exo suit and fight off wave after wave of enemies. As you go, you earn points to spend on new guns and upgrades. All hostiles are KIA. Load up if you need to. I like that they mix it up every few rounds by throwing in random objectives like having to defend a point or collect dog tags. Or they'll throw a few special troops at you who might have invisibility or be dogs. It breaks up the action nicely and keeps you on your toes. Yeah, and it's a solid mode that gives some of the less competitive players a nice option for co-op. Personally though, after a few rounds I'm usually done with them because there's only so long I can stand in one map and just shoot at an endless stream of bots. But we should wrap this up. With recent Call of Duties, it's always been about the multiplayer for me, and that's kept me in the game. But I'm happy to say with this one, it's the other way around. The campaign was fantastic, and I had a great time with it. I know. For me, the campaign was definitely the star as well. I was genuinely surprised at how good it was. Yeah, the multiplayer is good too, but I feel like Titanfall's already done that with the exosuits and the jetpacking around, and they did it a lot better. Still, this is a huge improvement on last year. I'm giving it 7.5. I'm giving it 8.5 out of 10 rubber chickens. You gentlemen did a hell of a job out there. I am grateful. To you, gentlemen. In a time of blight, demons, political unrest, poverty and war, the only thing that can unite the land is an inquisition. Shadows fall and hope has fled Steal your heart, the dawn will come The night is long and the path is dark Look to the sky for one day fight! The only destiny here that demands respect is mine! Just say what? What is that? seen the throne of the gods, and it was empty. The dawn will come. Dragon Age Inquisition is the third in the series, and a massive RPG brought to us by Bioware, the makers of Mass Effect. The first game, Dragon Age Origins, was a deep and turbulent journey for your character and also for the companions you took along the way and tried to have sex with. <laughs> and while Dragon Age 2 took a new direction that didn't quite hit the mark with fans, it's clear that Bioware has listened, and listened well. Inquisition is more like Origins 2 than Dragon Age 3, and this is a very good thing. 
Bit of a spoiler warning, we're going to talk about some of the companions you recruit, but we're not going to talk about the most exciting part of this game, the epic story. Or in my case, the story of one buck-toothed dwarf who fought against evil. The Inquisition requires a leader, the one who has already been leading it. And tried to have sex with everyone. You're flattering me. I'm not. <laughs> so lovely and selfless. Really, you give me too much credit. My blade pretty much protects me. Perhaps I can do things your blade can't. You're not interested in a dashing dwarven rogue? I, uh... <clears throat> I'm thinking less flattering things now. <laughs> oh, Bato, you sly dog. <laughs> well, not really, I guess. <laughs> yeah, he's a bit creepy. <laughs> you should see your face. <laughs> All right, well, let's get into it, Bajo. The Blight have gone underground, awaiting the rise of their new archdemon. But just when things seemed calm, this happened. We call it the Breach. It's a massive rift into the world of demons that grows larger with each passing hour. You find yourself in the wrong place at the wrong time, and somehow you're the sole survivor of a blast which caused this tear in the sky. It's quickly discovered that these rifts are everywhere, and the mark on your hand is somehow connected to them. Each time the breach expands, your mark spreads. This leads people to both worship and distrust you, which creates a lot of issues for you and your party. So it's time to put together an inquisition of heroes, leaders, and those who just want to help your cause and put a stop to these rifts once and for all. But in a world full of racism, fear of magic, and political power struggles... Shut your mouth, mate! Enough! This is no easy task, and you won't be able to keep everyone happy. The Maker would send no dwarf in our hour of need. Enough! The good news is, you get to choose how the events play out. What it means to you, how you lead us, that is for you alone to determine. Characters will remember the things you say and do and probably hold it against you at some point. Give me one reason to trust you. I want to know everything about every character in this game, Hex. Yeah, me too. I mean, no one is a blank slate, and the writing and the voice acting is just excellent, isn't it? Absolutely. And whenever there's a cameo from previous games... <gasps> Varric Tethrus, rogue, storyteller, and occasionally unwelcome tag-along. <laughs> Apparently there are 80,000 lines of dialogue this time. Yeah, it's actually a bit daunting knowing there's that much conversation ahead of you. I especially like the villains. You are the survivor, yes? The one from the Fade? Interesting. Oh, he's bad, gonna get him later. But most of all, I like that none of the villains in this game are bad or evil just for the sake of it. Each character you meet or fight alongside with has their own history, hopes and dreams and weaknesses. Felix, are you all right? Yeah, I think that's key to why these stories are so compelling, and that's also what keeps you involved. You can't tune out of a cutscene because a conversation choice might come up that you really should have paid attention to. ...is not a beneficiary of this arrangement. Yeah, and I think the dialogue is snappy enough that you don't actually want to skip anything anyway. And there's almost always room for exploring more dialogue options if you want to, including companion recruitment. My favourite so far is the instantly likeable Sarah. It's just a name, yeah? So here, in your face, I'm Sarah. Bye. She's a commoner thief archer who's part of a movement of small but many fighters. Here's how it is. You important people are up here, shoving your cods around. Blah, blah, I'll crush you, I'll crush you. Mm -hmm. Ooh, crush you. <clears throat> she even has her own bard song. She would always like to say on help with that. I changed the past when you could on the stage today. She will fight to keep her way. She's a rogue and a thief and she'll tempt your feet. I am quite in love with her hex, IRL as well as IGL in game life. And when I finally struck up the courage to try a bit of romance, I got this. I hope you'll feel the same. <laughs> Not even. Get to work, Herald. What? Well, maybe she's dwarfist. <laughs> you're all dwarfy. I don't mean nothing, but you're down there. I mean, it's all good, isn't it? I'm actually legit upset about it, and every time that I do something that she even slightly <laughs> disapproves of, it causes me pain IRL. <laughs> well, you've got to get to know a lady first, Bajo. And that is actually true because your team won't always like your decisions based on their own personal history and beliefs. I could at least find out what the mages want. No doubt what they've always wanted. Support for their cause. And even though we're far from finishing this game, it's reasonable to assume that this will have real and possibly gut-wrenching ramifications later down the track. Did I do the right thing? 
I was so pleased to discover you can turn off the tone indicators in conversations now. That was something that always bugged me about the Mass Effect series. And again, it's personal preference, but I just like not seeing a visual indication of my intention. This way, you really need to trust your gut more with the decisions you make. And there'll be ones that you just agonize over. Glad to see traitors are dealt with quickly. In an effort to address the cross-generation platform issue from the last games to this, Bioware have created the Dragon Age Keep. You can't use your old save files, but the Keep attempts to import around 200 of 300 choices from the previous games. And if you can't find those choices, you can go through manually and make changes. Then you can play out a beautiful video narrated by Varric. Hawk saved Kirkwall and earned the grudging respect of the city's Templars, mages, and nobility. I thought the lack of a save file import might upset fans, Barjo, but then I guess you're not playing as the same character through all three like in the Mass Effect games. Yeah, it's more about the world really, but having said that, if for some reason your previous choices didn't sync, then trying to remember everything that you did is really hard. I can't remember anything about what my hawk got up to in Dragon Age 2, except he was a bit mean. <laughs> Alright, we need to talk about how beautiful this game is. Oh yes. Now this is made with a Frostbite engine, which powers Battlefield 4, amongst other games. And also a vegetation engine called Speedtree, which has been used in many games and movies as well, from Avatar to Star Trek. The result is an incredible looking world that scales surprisingly well for older hardware too. Yes, I needed a small drool bucket for in front of my keyboard while I was playing this. It's just stunning at every turn. This isn't an open world, it's a series of massive zones stitched together. Deserts, hills, forests, and extravagant cities, and of course, dark, gritty dungeons through which you must crawl. Oh, it's so pretty. It's the reactive lighting and the fidelity of the visuals that really impressed me. Everything is just so crisp. From the freckles on characters' skin to the massive castles off in the distance, it's just a joy to clot through this lifelike land. I don't know that I was quite prepared for the high-res texture of Varric's chest hair, though. <laughs> I've got to admit, that's a twist I didn't see coming. Manly. The cinematic style of the choice-driven cutscenes show off the high character detail well, too. But they all do drop down to 30 frames per second and lock off there, which is noticeable at first. Maybe lower cutscene detail and higher frame rate there would have helped with those transitions. It's just a bit jarring and annoying. Yeah, agreed. Otherwise, it's silky smooth, especially out in the world. Mm. Oh, Bajo, I did many slow pans. Hex, I don't know if we have time for slow pans. We've got so much to talk about. Better make them quick pans. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, oh, mm, pretty. Yay. Right, let's talk about what you'll be doing in this game. In between closing rifts and sorting out political squabbles... And you're worried about land claims. You'll be running from bears, collecting herbs, chasing rams, running from bears, fighting zombies and templars, running from bears, crafting gear, horsey races, and being killed by bears. There's a lot to do. And finally, you can jump! Oh, I jumped everywhere, Hex. As you explore, quests will pop up on your map. You won't quite stumble into dungeons like with Skyrim, it's a little more structured than that. Even so, I found myself just wandering, noticing fights in the distance and then trying to sort out what was going on. <laughs> wow, we can watch, yeah? And the most important thing is, as you're moving through this land, you feel like you're actually changing things. You'll be helping out the little guy one day. Going to be a long, hungry night. And then fighting to save the world from an abominable evil the next. Opening up new locations is done within the frame of the Inquisition and what you do in your war room. Yes, you have a lot of meetings, don't you? Yes, but I really like this idea. Sending out agents for awards and recruiting randoms in the field when the opportunity presented itself. And it reinforces the main story all the time, which is so important in big RPGs. So you don't read my letters? You're no longer my prisoner. Much as you like to act like it. At the time of review, we're only about 25, 30 hours into the game, so we haven't seen how all the story plays out, but I'm having a good time so far. Yeah, plus as you adventure, you can have three companions with you and they'll all just chat with each other as you wander about. I love it when they bicker. Me too. <coughs> it was a bitch. Charming. Fact. There are three main classes. Mage, Rogue and Warrior. But each of these have subset classes. So a rogue can be an archer or more up close and personal. A warrior can sword and board or use a two-hander. 
They're all pretty fun, and with so many trees and paths, there's massive room for developing your own party strategies. Yeah, there's a lot of choices to really make your character your own. I restarted this game about 10 times just trying to pick a race and build a face, let alone a class. How much is this going to cost me, exactly? I did find that the mages are instantly exciting as they dance with magic and unleash devastating abilities. Spectacular. Yeah, those sword and board hits though, Barjo. So rewarding. I mean, it's, it's classic dungeon crawling combat, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And there's heaps of gear to play with too. The crafting system is a little hard to get your head around. And even after days of play, I still struggle a bit just trying to equip gear on my heroes. But these are minor criticisms, really. What matters is when you're out in the thick of it, evil gets smited. Yes, and brilliantly. There's bonuses for mixing abilities, such as freezing an enemy with a mage and then shield bashing them. Or putting up an ice wall to block archers and slow enemies while your team focus fires on another. Throw in some upgradable potion grenades, such as a jar of bees, and it's a rich banquet of fantasy combat to discover. Your AI buddies do need a little bit of looking after at times, especially when ranged gets too close to the action. Or if there's a lot of vegetation or debris around, that can cause some issues too. I just never tire of these fights though, Bajo. Yeah, me neither. They cleaned up the user interface as well, so you can just play this in real time with all the information you need on screen. You can lock onto enemies now, which is fantastic for ranged, but I found playing as a warrior, it was just a bit too hectic with that camera so close. Healing potions have been balanced with a cap, so you can only hold a finite number of them. It adds a lot of real threat to the fights as well. Yes, the days of potting through a fight you're not quite ready for are gone, and this is actually for the better. But where the combat truly shines is when you're in trouble. And happily, the strategic isometric view that made the PC version of Origins stand out above the rest is here for all platforms. This turns the game into a chessboard of infinite moves as you plot out attacks, angles, and quickly save those who are about to fall. So you can play Inquisition on normal or casual and still have a decent enough challenge, but playing on hard opens up so many strategic necessities. It's ultimately a richer experience. It really is, and without feeling hard for no reason either. Plus, it's so visually exciting to move about a fight with time paused like that. One thing I noticed which had changed is that the combat tactics have actually been simplified a bit. And at first I was a bit miffed by that, but looking back, it actually wasn't that fun sifting through all of those tactics. Totally, I, mean, I welcome that change. Now, yes, it is a bit simpler, but I think the AI has improved enough to compensate for that and let you focus on solid, balanced strategy. Rather than fiddling with what were essentially a series of if-then combat rules. There's just so much more we could talk about with this game. So many tweaks to the fighting systems. And even 25, 30 hours in, we're still discovering new mechanics and things to do. But we should talk about the multiplayer, which is here for the first time, and designed off the surprisingly fun oh, Mass Effect 3 co-op, but with a dungeon crawler theme. Oh, I'm out of potions. Uh oh this guy. Come to me, come to me. Coming to Rewards are completely separate from the main game, though, and we weren't able to spend much time with it at the time of review. Run, run, run. Oh, here's the big guy. Run away, run away! Run! Ah! Run! <laughs> but what we did play was certainly engaging. Yeah, it was thrilling seeing those Dragon Age mechanics play out with players controlling each of the party members. Oh, take Run that, away. scum! Oh, yes! <laughs> we are a sick team. But we should wrap this up. What do you think overall, Hex? Well, this is a big meal to digest and a massive accomplishment of RPG design and scale. But most importantly, the stories are there with writing that's filled with drama, but also levity and, and humanity as well. Also, I have so many horses to unlock. I'm giving this 10 out of 10. It wasn't until months after I finished the first game, Origins, that I realised how important it actually was to me. And all of those characters, they felt like my real life friends. And I'm starting to get that vibe with this too, just on a much grander scale. I love this game. I'm giving it 10 out of 10 as well. We've got a big 10. We almost got to the end of the year without a double 10, Barjo. That would have been so sad. That's crazy. Also, if we get a game which is 1 or 0 out of 10, we can use this. That is true. Efficient. Roger, the self-destruct sequence is jammed. I'm gonna have to detonate it manually. No, Hex! There's got to be another way! There isn't one. There isn't time. Just remember. Remember what, Hex? Remember what? Remember to always ask yourself, did you name the game for this? It was Kingdom Under Fire, Circle of Doom.
Released back in 2007 on the Xbox 360, it was the fourth installment in the Kingdom Under Fire franchise and the first to do away with the real-time strategy elements and focus purely on hack and slash gameplay. And it's our name the game this week as it featured the voice of actor Gideon Emery, who played Gideon in this week's Call of Duty Advanced Warfare. He was born to play that role, Hex. <laughs> Next week on the show, more Assassin's Creed with Unity. After the douchebaggery of the last Far Cry, the new instalment tries for a more mature tone. You can ride elephants. Elephus Maximus is the biggest mammal in the land. These beasts have no natural predators. Until next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Larger wings. I have a bit of eyeline. It's a bit hard to see it. Blush colour. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, apologies if any of you look like this guy. <laughs>